Hello, everyone. Welcome to this eighth podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your host, Bob Tremblay, factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation, volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, and the Director of Outreach for the Warren Astronomical Society in Michigan. With us is Brother Guy Consolmagno, President of the Vatican Observatory Foundation and Director of the Vatican Observatory. Our guest for this podcast is astrophysicist Heino Falke. Heino's main field of study is black holes. He's the originator of the concept of the black hole shadow. In 2011, Heino won the Spinoza Prize given by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. In 2013, his team received a research grant from the European Research Council to further studies of black holes. In 2019, he announced the first Event Horizon Telescope results at the EHT press conference in Brussels. Heino is the author of Light in the Darkness, Black Holes, the Universe, and Us. Welcome, Heino. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. It's uh, great to be back at the Vatican Observatory, alas, just uh, virtually. So what inspired you to get the idea that one could image the shadow of a black hole and and then write a book about it? <laughs> well, th- that's a long process, okay? It took 25 years so at, at, at the very least. I'm and visual. it's a couple of chapters in the book. So it's, I, I didn't realize when we came up with that question, it was before I read the book, I just finally got a copy of it. And oh my gosh, what an evolved process. As you say, 20 years of work to get that happening. Yeah, actually, more than that, from the first idea, that was five years earlier. I mean, you still have to, you know, you come up with a concept. You know, it's it, in the end, it's in hindsight, it's so obvious what you need to do. But in the early 90s, you know, thinking to be able to image a black hole was just a crazy concept. You know, people didn't think about that. But I'm a visual person. I want to see things and I want to, you know, go to the frontiers of, of knowledge. And I was realizing during my PhD that you know, a certain type of radio mission would come from directly near the event horizon. And there, there is a technique that would might, you know, allow us to see that. And so you put things together and you get very excited. But it takes five years then from this, you know, first idea to really work it out and, and, and be able to you know, convincingly tell colleagues, yes, that's what we got to do. And that takes another 20 years to realize the experiment together have, with many people. I have to say, of course, I was fortunate to be at that press conference. You'd invited me there and I was in Brussels for an IAU event that day. Managed to make it just in time, having missed trains and all sorts of adventures. I, I remember exchanging a lot of uh, text messages with you at the, t- at the day. <laughs> yeah, just as you had a, a few other more important things to worry about. <laughs> At the time, I hadn't realized what a central role you had played in all of this. And certainly reading about it in the book gave me a much deeper appreciation. The whole chapter about the days when you made the observations, it was a page turner. I couldn't stop reading that chapter. It was just so exciting. And and what gave you the idea to write the book? I didn't want to write a book. (laughs) that's what they always say but you know when this all you know this whole thing you know came out and it's really exploded it it, and uh, and people talking about it and and that image really reached four and a half billion people it just publishers approached me and said you want to write a book and and uh well you know i want to do this when i'm uh, when i'm retired but then you know they really convinced me. Now is the time, and now is the time to tell the story in in and you know really maybe inspire people. And and interestingly, they wanted more. They just they not just wanted a, a technical description of of that process. They wanted you know really talk about you know not only just black holes but the entire universe and what it means. And so that's something I love to do. And that well okay now I have to write it. And so I took the time off and I needed you know twice as much time as I was pl- had planned to write that thing. There was, but you know, I almost have to say, fortunately, it happened when Corona broke out. So, you know, we were all sitting in, in a lockdown. So suddenly I had much more time available at home to write the book. I have to say, too, as a compliment to how good the book is, it follows the rule of all good science books, which is it's not just about science. It's also about people. Mm. And you may manage to make all these people come alive and you tell us a little bit about their backgrounds and where they're from. And, you know, the, the, the young woman who is the, you know, the fabulous programmer whose uh, you know, family is from Algeria, just all of these details that brings the whole story alive. And I was fascinated by all of that. Yeah, I've, these details you only can tell when you live through it yourself and you knew all these people. And uh, I noticed I've, I've been giving public lectures for like 20, 25 years as well. And 
you know, often people come to me afterwards that, oh, it was so nice you were talking about your son. And, you know, it, it's sometimes these little stories about people that, that interest them. Uh, science is, is fascinating, it's interesting, but it's always done by science. Science is a human endeavor. It's a human enterprise. It's a, some, sometimes it's an art. It's, it, it contains personalities and, and that, you know, brings it to life, I think. So that's why it's important to, to, to also talk about, you know, the human side of science. One of the things you bring into this, which is sometimes direct and sometimes just hidden, is your own religious understanding of the universe and your own religious background, which was something, of course, that we talked about 25 years ago at the Vatican. And I remember thinking of that when you described the size of the object that you're looking at in comparison to a mustard seed at, you know, halfway around the world. I'm thinking, I know where that mustard seed comes from. <laughs> You understood it. Most other people didn't. But uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, I grew up with biblical stories and analogies, and that's what I use. I mean, that that what speaks to me. That, that's what makes it interesting. And it's part of my life. It's part of my, you know, of, of who I am. And I was thinking about what, what I would do with that in the book. And I thought, you know, I want to be honest. I, I just want to, you know, I give a fair account of who I am and, and what happened to me, how I thought about things. And, and so it had to be part of the book. It's not, you know, it's not a major part of it. Um, but, you know, I just couldn't hide it. I mean, there, there are certainly parts, you know, when, when I was very, you know, when I was burned out and so forth that, you know, uh, I, I needed the, the silence and, and the presence of, um, you know, of, of the church to some degree, right? So that, that's where I recover. And it was also interesting when I discussed that with a publisher that said, oh, yeah, you know, write, please write about this. And, you know, we I had a German publisher that had published Hawking before. And they said, you know, you know, th that book sold, you know, like crazy. And, you know, what, what, what was interesting for people, it was, you know, the chapter about God. So, I, you know, I want you to write about it as well. So what's your vision? You know, maybe it's probably different from Hawking. So, so let us know. So it, I did. Um, yeah. And, and some people appreciate it. And some people, you know, said, you know, why, why, why does he write about, you know, religion? But, you know, look, guys, you know, and girls, we, we, we've been you know, doing signs for and thinking about the universe for, for, for actually thousands of years. And it's always been connected to, to religious questions, theological questions, and, and, you know, the ultimate questions of life and, and the universe and God. What's your actual uh, connection with the, uh, the German Evangelical Kirche? It's the, it's the Protestant church, you know, evangelical has a different meeting in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Now, I'm, I'm ordained minister, a lay minister. I didn't study theology, but I was ordained. So I actually, I, I preach, I, you know, I baptize people, I, uh, I, 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 I marry them, I, I conduct funerals, I do the whole thing. I just, I'm not I'm getting money for it. You outrank me. <laughs> I, I don't do it that often anymore, unfortunately, because of, I'm running out of time. So it's, um, you know, I used to do it, you know, once a month, probably in, in, you know, during my studies and later. Now it's only occasionally that I can still do it. But I want to ask you a question similar to what I get asked all the time being at the Vatican Observatory. And this is the Vatican Observatory Foundation's uh, podcast. How do you explain the way that you integrate your religion and your scientific work? For me, science is part of my religious thinking as well. If I you know, want to understand how that universe works, I look at the creator and I think about you know, where did everything come from? And you know, when I you know, do science, it's for me also understanding a little bit about God. It, it, it means, you know, how, how do things work? You know, what... Natural laws are for me, you know, also laws of God. It's not something that's independent of God. You know, if, if God created that universe, if God is the beginning, you know, what and who God is is a big, big question, you know, that, you know, we try to answer with religion, but we never can fully understand. But, um, you know, if, if, if God is at the beginning of the universe and doing science is exploring a little aspect, you know, an important aspect of, of that creation. But I think there's more than we can understand with just natural laws. Um, there is always an infinite amount of knowledge and beginning that we'll never be able to touch and address. That's so much bigger than everything that we can experience, that we can, that we can measure. In fact, we are, many things we fundamentally can't measure, that we always have to live with belief and faith um, to actually make sense of this world and make sense of ourselves even if it means the faith to think that for 25 years you can work on something as crazy as imaging a black hole, thinking it might actually work. 
I think, yeah, you first have to believe that you're going to see something before you can see it. So what have we learned about black holes as a result of the EHT images? And how close was that first image to your expectations? It was so amazingly close. That, that really blew me away. You know, it's, I mean, I describe this always as, you know, you have a, a, a picture in your mind of something or someone, right? So you have a love, you know, that, that you've been in contact with for 20 years, a secret love, but you've never met her or him in your entire life. But you, you know, you know exactly how he or she looks like. And then you meet for the very first time and, and, and he or she looks just even more beautiful than you imagined. And that, that's really how it, you know, it happened to me with, with that black hole. It, it really looked as, it, it almost looked too perfect, which, which scared me. I thought, you know, are we, are we fooling ourselves? I mean, is that, you know, are we finding this because we want to see it? So that was a scary moment as well, or and also an, an a moment filled with awe as well, right? Because you knew what, if, if it were true, what that would mean, if, 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 if that's true. And what it means is actually, you know, you know we've been studying these supermassive black holes for, uh, for, for many decades. They were found like, you know, to exp- or introduced to explain quasars, you know, these bright objects in the center of galaxies, billions of light years away, extremely bright. And people think this could be black holes. And we've been zooming in and in and, and the evidence what got stronger and stronger, stronger. And now we actually see them. We know they're really black holes. Um, you know, they, it could still make up some theories with, you know, almost like black holes, but they're somewhat different. But, you know, this really looks like a black hole. It has a black hole in the center. You know, this light is disappearing in the event horizon. That, that's what we're seeing. So that, that, that's what determines a, a black hole. So I think we've really nailed the case, you know, that supermassive black holes exist in the centers of galaxies. One of the things that you talk about in the book is how these black holes are not in the popular image of gobbling up everything around and they're going to eventually suck the entire universe into them. But you had a marvelous phrase about them sort of like being uh, on a diet. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It's quite interesting because um, we got to know black holes as these really bright stars of the universe that outshine everything, entire galaxies. But really, there's a silent majority. That was sort of my my PhD thesis. Uh, The silent majority of black holes, which are actually, you know, very quiet. They don't swallow a lot of matter. And so they are, you know, hard to see even. They don't produce much radiation. And the center of our galaxies is one of these. It's, uh, it's visible for us with some great telescopes, but otherwise it's not very prominent, like many other supermassive black holes. So you know, if you don't feed a black hole, it won't do anything. You know, it really, you know, it's, it's like a, a little uh, a chicken in a nest or so that, you know, waits for, for the mother or, or, or father to come and, and, and feed her. So um, that's, that's what black holes are, because... In the end, the collective mass of the entire galaxy, of all the stars, always overwhelms uh, those monsters. That's maybe a lesson we learned from this. (laughs) One of the odd things about black holes, as you say, is that everyone thinks of them as being black, and yet they're also really bright. How is it that a black hole can give off so much energy? I thought they were supposed to be sucking in all of the light. What's going on there? Yeah, and they do, and that that's a secret because everything that falls in gets faster and faster and, and reaches almost the speed of light. And so if all this matter then, you know, doesn't fall straight into the black hole, but just takes some turns, goes around, has him, you know, uh, goes in, in, in circles in the disk, you know, it, it smashes into each other. It, it, it creates, you know, viscosity, heat, and heats up to billions of, of uh, hundreds of billions of degrees in that makes it the most radiative efficient object object in the entire universe. In fact, much more efficient than than the nuclear fusion in the sun uh, by a large margin. So, uh, if you want to turn you know matter into energy, throw it into a black hole. That's the best thing you can do. So, if you're going to have a science fictional uh, fusion drive, rather than doing fusion, you just carry a small black hole in a bottle and slowly dra- you know dump stuff into it, and the energy irradiated from that would be far more efficient. Except that I have to carry the black hole, and I, I'm not sure I want to be that close to it. But yeah, you know, that would be an idea to, to, <laughs> to explore. I've got a question that I've always wanted to ask you, and I've never had the moment before. You describe the image, the famous image, as the shadow of a black hole. Can you actually get information about the shape of the black hole from the shape of this shadow? Yeah, that, that's why we talk about the shadow, because you cannot see the black hole. You know, it's hiding behind its own shadow. It's, you know, it's, it's absorbing light, but the shadow can have a shape. And, you know, it's, you know, it's fairly circular. 
but you know it can have a little dent if it's rotating very fastly. And if the black hole would not be a black hole, it could have a different shape. It could be you know a little bit like an oval, or you know, it could be triangular. Not really triangular, but you know it, it could have dents and, and and other things. So yeah, we, we actually use the shape of the shadow to constrain theories of gravity because you know gravity or, or general relativity is simple. It actually predicts a rather simple shape of uh, the shadow. And if it's not, then there's something interesting going on. For now, it seems to be simple. One of the things that, that comes to my mind being a planetary scientist is that if you've got you know a, a gaseous body like Jupiter and you know how fast it's spinning and you know how flattened it is at the top and the bottom, you can turn that into information about what's going on inside Jupiter. Can you play that kind of trick with a black hole? Hardly, because it hardly contains any information. The only information that a black hole contains or retains is how heavy it is, and that determines how big the shadow is. So the more mass is in there, the bigger the shadow, and how fast it spins. And that, you know, you see by it having a little, you know, dent on one side. That's it. All other information, what's going on inside, doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's no matter anymore. It's, it's just a black hole. It's, you know, it's, it is doesn't matter in, in the very center. And, and so in that sense, black holes are the simplest object in the universe. You know, every end, every bacteria, every virus, is, it's infinitely more, you know, not infinitely, but, you know, extremely more complicated than a black hole is, which is a bit surprising, you, you may think. Okay, so, so the movie Interstellar had a, a representation of, of a black hole. How was that? How accurate was that? Yeah, it's always hailed as a proper description or depiction of, of, of a black hole because they've done the, the ray tracing. But you know, the astrophysical model they used was actually not quite what we see. It, it, it looks rather different in the end. But there are certain aspects that you see. You see you know, some aspects of the shadow. And, and the time travel, not time travel, but the way how time changes if you go close to a black hole and come back, that you know, your, your colleague is suddenly 30 years older than... Uh, than you, you who spent just a few hours near near the near the black hole, uh, that's certainly accurate. I hope that we changed, you know, the the way we see black holes with our image. Um, but Hollywood has a very strong um, impact, of course. I hope the next movie will make it even better. What's been the interaction between the way that the public sees black holes portrayed, either by a NASA press release or a movie like Interstellar, compared to what you guys are doing now? Now, we give the real picture except, of course, of the color, because we are looking at radio waves, and the color you see in our image is a, a, a false color image. And it's something that we used in our prediction in the paper in 2000. We, we, we coded it red, you know, translated radio colors into red colors because, you know, that, you know, portrayed uh, heat and danger, you know, that, that represents black holes. And I think that was a, a right choice. And I now see that suddenly, you know, black holes are colored red uh, when NASA comes out. NASA comes out with a, with a new image or, or whatever. So I think we've changed at least that aspect of uh, popular culture. So are you going to be imaging Sagittarius A star? We are imaging it, actually. We are looking at the data that we took in 2017. That was the main goal. That, to some degree, is sort of speak the holy grail of, of our research. We want to see the black hole in the center of our Milky Way because it has been measured so precisely. You know, we know from the stars going around, you can use them to measure very precisely how heavy it is. And uh, it's slightly bigger. And we can test the theory of gravity much better in the center of our Milky Way. So that is our next big challenge. But the, this source is a bit, you know, it's a bit smaller and much more uh, variable and changing on a much shorter time scale. It makes it a bit harder to see. But, you know, as a good scientist, you love a good challenge. And we're working on it. And let's see what comes out. So how did you get interested in astronomy in the first place? I think I, w I was always asking the big questions, you know, what... You know, I, I was lying in bed and asking, you know, what, you know, what's behind heaven and what's behind what's behind heaven and so forth. I was, you know, keep asking. I never got an answer, so to speak. And and I want to go to the edge of what we know. Uh, you know, keeping keeping asking. And uh, and so I was actually wondering whether I want, want to do with theology or something with physics. You know, and then I was doing thinking about particle physics. But then I realized, you know, we have such an enormous universe out there and there's so many things happening. We're discovering so many new things in astronomy nowadays. Um, and, and, and particle physics was getting, you know, 
you know, really tough, you know, <laughs> and, and the progress was slowing down when I was starting my studies. And I think I made the right choice. I mean, we, you know, boy, how have, have we expanded our universe, the knowledge of our universe? What have we learned the last 20, 25 years? And I was midden in the middle of, of this golden age of astronomy and, and was able to, to live through that and experience that. Uh, yeah, that, that, was the, that was the right choice. Still can do a little bit of theology, though, in, in, on the side. I was thinking of that when you were talking about quasars, because I remember when I was an undergraduate, when I was a master's student, my roommate was working on models of quasars. And this was 1974. They had no idea if quasars really were far away or nearby or what they were all about. And we've gone from that utter lack of knowledge to now having an image of a black hole all in one lifetime. It's, it is and, mind boggling. And we can model them in the computer, you know, like we model the weather or the climate or whatever in our supercomputers. We, 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 we model black holes and they actually look like real black holes. So it looks like we really have, you know, some pretty good understanding of what they do. Well, he was doing a computer model too. He had a stack of uh, computer cards that was probably two <laughs> inches thick. <laughs> I remember those days I was, you know, I was working in the university clinics when I was very young and I was supposed to type things on, on these punch cards. And I was, the first thing I did was got rid of them. This was the last time, you know, punch cards were seen in this, in, in this uh, hospital. I do have to ask, uh, you're talking about your interest as a kid. Where was your family <laughs> from? You know, what, what was your dad doing? My dad was a doctor, you know, he was an orthopedist. Uh, my, my mom was a teacher. My grandfather was a farmer uh, and the other grandfather was a, a, a lawyer. And uh, so my kids now are theologo theologians, and, you know, management, uh, PhD student and, and mus musician. So we have that tradition that you're not allowed to do what your parents have done, I guess. And my wife's a teacher. Right. We, of course, had you here live for our Super Voss in 2019 which was soon after the uh, the big announcement. That was great fun. And Absolutely. of course, you and I met in 1993, to make you feel good and old, when yes. you were a graduate student and I had just joined the observatory and we both took part in the 93 Vatican Observatory Summer School. I recall that you showed up one weekend, your wife and baby daughter showed up, which you know, kind of gave everyone a thrill. How's the family doing? Well, in the meantime, we have three kids, and uh, and and my daughter now has studied theology, is becoming a pastor actually, and they've all left home. Um, the the youngest son is making music, and uh, I only learned much later uh, when she was adult and when I, you know, produced that and showed that image of of a black hole. We talked about it that she was really scared of black holes. I thought I never brought my work home. And uh, but apparently I had talked about black holes and she was totally scared as a kid. <laughs> so I've got one last question as we're, we're basically running, you know, towards the end of this. So what are you planning on doing in the next 10 years? I mean, you've oh, conquered the black holes, right? What's left to be done? Yeah, but good science requires uh, patience as well. And 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 uh, yeah, you know, we have, you know, we, we just made one image. So we need to make many more images to really measure it well. I mean, you know. You can't just stop when, when it just all started. It's like, you know, you, you set foot on a new continent. You saw a new world and now you want to stop and not explore it. No, I, I, I want to see more of that. We want to have more telescopes. You know, we want to even have one telescope in Africa now to expand the network. Eventually, you may want to go to space to make really super sharp, razor sharp images of, of black holes. So that's all literally at the horizon uh, for us to do. And, you know, and I may still continue writing, maybe still write another book. We'll see. One of the one of the things that is part of the story that's so astonishing to me, you're talking about spreading the telescopes across the world. And it's a very simple formula. The size of the object you can see depends on how far apart you can make the telescopes. How does it happen that the Earth is just the right size to see a black hole? I think that's just a little miracle that happened to us. There are a few coincidences that made it just possible. The Earth was just big enough. So, you know, had the Earth been, you know, half the size or the object of the black hole, like a little bit smaller, we would not have been able to see it. It would have been too small. The atmosphere, you have to go to a radio frequency where the Earth is just transparent. If you, if you would have gone to higher frequencies, um, it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, to actually see through the, uh, the universe. So that's, uh, that's a blessing. And then if you look at the center of our Milky Way, which is another black hole that we still want to image, that's blurred by our Milky Way itself. You know, it's scattered. It's, it's, it's blurred, that image. 
in just at that frequency that we're observing, it, it just becomes that blurring effect goes away. So there's a little tiny window in frequency where you can see this. And it, it, it waited for us to be, you know, this is a, a sweet spot, so to speak, we're sitting in. And it waited for us to explore. And it could have been, it, it could have been completely impossible to do. And it, it's just, there's no physics that tells us that the Earth has to be, you know, it has to be that size relative to a supermassive black hole in a galaxy 55 million light years away. It's just, you know, pure coincidence, a little miracle that we are really thankful for. Well, one of the other miracles is the way that you were able to pull together so many people to work together. Uh, the introduction that uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell wrote for you, I had to get a laugh out of because she says, oh yeah, pictures of black holes. Sure, why not? The real miracle is he managed to get all of these different groups to work with each other and all of the different funding agencies. And that is an accomplishment that you know just was incredible. But uh, in particular, the final miracle was that you had good weather at yes. all of the different sites at the same time. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, uh, absolutely. I, I didn't tell even all the details of, of how the internals worked and it was certainly not a smooth process, still isn't. I mean, scientists have egos and getting them together is, uh, you know, an interesting process. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and, and then you go to the experiment and you have, you, you to the t telescope and you have, ex you know, prepared everything. But, you know, when I went to the telescope, typically it was bad weather or, t or, or something went wrong. So I, that's what I was expecting. And then we go to the telescope in 2017. Everything is set up. The press is even reporting about us. I was totally nervous. You know, how, do, how did they know about us? You know, they're looking at us. And I'm sure it'll be bad weather. And I was at this telescope in Spain, uh, and it was blue sky. And it essentially was perfect weather throughout, you know, the entire week. That never happened before. And, it, you know, it was perfect weather all around the world at all the other telescopes as well. Because, you know, these radio waves are being absorbed by, by, by clouds and stuff. So uh, these high-frequency radio waves... <laughs> so that was just, you know, pure, pure luck. I mean, you could have, you, you could have had, and people have had that bad luck uh, year after year with bad weather at one crucial telescope, and it would not have been the same. Remind us of where some of the telescopes were located that went into this effort. Yeah, no, I, I was in Spain at the time, and uh, near the Alhambra in Granada in, uh, in in Spain. There's one in Hawaii. That's sort of really the other side of the of the Earth. Actually, two in Hawaii. There's one in Arizona, the Mount Graham in Mexico at four thousand five hundred meter height. In Chile, of course, a big ALMA telescope and the South Pole telescope. So we really span the world in Europe, the America, South Pole. We're still missing, as I said, Africa. That would you know fit very nicely, and people think it even of moving the telescope further than that, spreading it you know, across, across the Earth and eventually go to space, as I said. It would seem to be an ideal thing to have a telescope on, say, the far side of the moon. Or how uh, about at both Lagrangian points? Uh, yeah, but that's a bit far to start, right? So you don't, because then you have such a big gap and you only have one direction, and that gives only sort of a very limited image quality. So you want to have the, the telescope, like the Earth rotates, and that fills in all information because you have different angles from where you look at the black hole. And so you may want to have your satellites orbiting the Earth. Um, so, you know, I would use it, I, you know, I would like to use the, the backside of the moon to observe the Big Bang at, with low frequency radio telescope. And black hole imager, I would first realize in free space, probably. But who knows, you know, at some point, maybe we go all the way out there and make even sharper images because, you know, eventually we have the technique. We could actually image every black hole in this entire universe if you wanted to. Okay, there's one other thing about this which I find fascinating, which is the data rate. How you actually transmitted the, uh, what is it, peta, giga, whatever amounts of data? Yeah, it was in the end. We re what we do is we store the light on hard drives, and this amounted to four petabytes. Um, so that's thousand terabytes in uh, on, on on hard drives, and that needs to be processed first. And that was actually a technological breakthrough, and and uh, that's certainly something that that you know our colleagues in in the U.S. were very in, in important to to develop uh, this broadband digital backend equipment that allowed us to process huge amount of data, store a huge amount of radio waves on hard drives, and then process them, process them in the computer. 
So, you know, we definitely benefited from the technical revolution, even though our data transport is still by horse, so to speak, or by, <laughs> by van, because you're shipping these hard drives from the telescopes, you know, by van and airplane and, and you know, by foot almost to uh, the correlation centers, because the internet is not fast enough. Certainly not if you connect the South Pole. I remember that, uh, you know, in the 90s, a friend of mine said, oh, they'll never be able to stream movies because it's so much fa sneaker uh, net is so much faster than the Ethernet because you can just carry a, a disc someplace. Well, we have you know, movies on the Internet now, but we certainly are still using sneaker net to carry across petabytes of data. That's true. Yes, absolutely. But who knows? Maybe it will, you know, even that will change and we'll get, you know, a, a terabit per second internet to the South Pole. Who knows? You know, in, 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 in 20, 30, 40 years. But then we've done probably all the black holes from, you know, that we wanted to see. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this time. Thank you. It was great talking to you. And best of luck with the book. It's uh, doing really well. I, you, you made the front page in the Italian newspapers this past weekend. So, uh, Okay, I didn't even see that. Thank you for letting me know. I was wondering what's <laughs> happening there. <laughs> okay, that's a wrap for this podcast. I'd like to thank our guests, Heino Falke and Brother Guy Consolmagno. I'm Bob Tremblay. You can read posts from Brother Guy and me and listen to our other podcasts on the website of the Vatican Observatory. Clear skies, everyone.